Hey peeps, welcome back to the Majesty of Reason. Today I'm joined by Dr. Scott Berman, a philosophy professor at St. Le Louis University. Uh, we'll be talking about Platonism, its motivations and its different problems. And what prompted this discussion was uh, Scott's 2020 book, Platonism and the Objects of Science, published with Bloomsbury. You guys can check links in the description uh, to different resources, including a link uh, to that book. So uh, Scott, first, thank you for uh, coming on. And second, um, feel free to add, any, add anything about yourself. Uh, thanks for having me uh, in the discussion with you. And I also, in addition to being a philosophy professor, I'm also the academic program coordinator for the uh, prison education program at St. Louis University. Just wanna give a shout out to that program. Nice, nice, all right. So um, before outlining the structure of our discussion, uh, I have two preliminaries. So um, first, can you tell us like the main thesis of your book? Uh, and second, can you tell us why you wrote the book? Uh, the main thesis of the book is that the best explanation for what science is about, both the experiments and the epistemic uh, objects, the objects of knowledge, are uh, things that Plato would have uh, endorsed and talked about uh, 2,400 years ago, as opposed to all of the anti-Platonic views that have come since. And uh, I think that one of the motivations for the book uh, was that it seemed to me that in contemporary metaphysics and discussions about these issues, Plato's view was never considered. It was always dismissed out of hand from the get-go because uh, people were using a caricature view of Plato, a view that Plato didn't actually have. And the view that, that I think, I don't, I'm not gonna try to defend this, but uh, I think Plotinus was the reason for this mischaracterization of Plato's view, which influenced Augustine and then we're off. And so that way of framing what Plato was doing was, was uh, nowadays is not correct. And so I thought that his view actually gave us a better explanation than the ones currently in the offing nowadays. And so I wanted to just be uh, put a book out there uh, where I include that as part of the historical discussion. And uh, I also wanted to write a book that was not something that only 10 people would read. So uh, my goal was to write a book that uh, was written as close to everyday language as possible, uh, but at a very deep, level. Uh, so again, my model here is Plato, who wrote about wrote in everyday Greek about very deep and complex issues in a very uh, rigorous way, I think. And uh, so that was my goal. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if I succeeded. I was, about was to, I was about to say, I think you succeeded in that, at least by my life. But then again, I mean, you know, I'm kind of into the weeds of philosophy. So yeah. who knows? But I, I really enjoyed it. So it's great. Um, oh, good. Thank but you. Yeah, yeah. So now let's get to the, the structure of the video, which I will outline uh, for the audience. We also have uh, that kind of diagram that we can go through when we're talking about the different views. So um, we'll get to that and I can share my screen uh, for that and you can talk us through that. But for the structure of the video, uh, first, we're going to look at some definitions, uh, def defining like the objects of science, what Platonism is and, and so on. Secondly, we're going to be looking at different motivations for Platonism and particularly the ones explored in Scott's book. Third, we're going to be looking at some objections to Platonism that are both popular objections that you see like in the online sphere, as well as in academic journals and whatnot. And then finally, we'll, uh, we'll conclude. So uh, now let's move on to the definitions. So uh, can, can you, Scott, define uh, what an object of science is for us? Sure. Uh, an object of, object of science is just whatever science is about. And so uh, I'm thinking that there are uh, definitely the objects of scientific experiments, so the, the things in space-time. And then for the Platonist, uh, the goal is to show that the objects of scientific knowledge are non-spatiotemporal things that are mind-independent and exist in the same sense that you and I exist in. So that's what the Platonist would say the objects of science are. And the, the objects of scientific experiments are not what Aristotle thought they were substances, uh, independently existing things. They, they're, instead, they're four-dimensional, uh, spatiotemporally extended complex dynamical systems. 
And uh, in order to understand what these different systems are, uh, the non-spatiotemporal things, the objects of knowledge have to be uh, scale relative parameters. So they're, they're kinds of quantities uh, that are uh, relative to the scale of, of space time that you're measuring. All right, that's good. So at this point, we could probably, because now we're gonna start defining um, Platonism, universals in particular, and nominalism and whatnot, I think we can probably uh, start sharing the screen. So let's see if I can get my technical abilities up. <laughs> okay, so uh, what I think is that, I think the, the default ontological view, so an ont ontology is just basically, if, if someone asked you to get out a piece of paper and write down on that piece of paper, everything that exists, what would you put on that piece of paper and what would you leave off and why? And I think that uh, the default metaphysical ontological view is uh, both developmentally as well as intellectually is the view that the, uh, the only things that exist are things that are located in space time. Mm -hmm. so I think that's the default, that's where people start. Uh, and I take that for granted that there are spatiotemporal things on that list of things that exist. So you, me, our chairs, the buildings we're in, the planets and so forth, that all those things exist. Of course, they're contentious when you get into the details of what those are, but at least there are such things that uh, I'm just, I don't even discuss nihilism, just yeah. sort of leave that alone <laughs> to the side. We're talking about science here. So the nihilist view is not, uh, I think gonna be a player here. So on the assumption that all the people in this discussion agree that there are spatiotemporal things of some sort, uh, then the question is, do we expand that list of things to include non-spatiotemporal things? And so uh, the way I think about problems is just by means of destructive dilemmas. Mm -hmm. So you ask a question, yes or no, and then you just, if you can't, you try to shut down one arm, if you can, then you go to the next arm and then you subdivide that and then you subdivide that and just keep destructive dilemma uh, procedures. Okay, so the first question I ask is, do any non-spatial temporal uh, entities exist? And I think that the default view would say no, that everything is spatiotemporal. And so if that's true, then the next question one would ask is, do any universals exist? And if you say no, then you're a nominalist. If you say yes, then you're a contemporary Aristotelian. So, uh, uh, I guess, should I say why? Yeah, let, I... yeah, let's go through, let's just define them while we're here. So um, can you take us through uh, what, what you mean by nominalism and what you mean by contemporary Aristotelianism while we're here? <laughs> sure. So uh, in nominalism, I take the view to be that, that a necessary condition for existence is locatability in space-time and the rejection of universals. I take that to be a nominalist view. Another kind of view, which is also a spatio-temporalist view, is contemporary Aristotelian. And the contemporary Aristotelian uh, agrees that everything is in space time, but thinks that in addition to the particulars that are located in unique places, there also exist universals that are located in space time everywhere uh, they're instantiated. And so they can be multiply located. So it's, the, it's one and the same thing, uh, universal located in multiple places. Yeah, that's, that's good. Idea. So I think we should give some examples, hopefully, for the audience. So, you know, example is going to be controversial, but, you know, something like, um, let's just use an example of something on my table. Okay, so blackness is presumably something like a, a property or a universal, uh, because blackness is multiply instantiable. It can be instantiated or um, exemplified by uh, both my phone and this, this, this scissors and, you know, things behind me. They're all black. They have something in common. Uh, so blackness is, uh, in some sense, multiply located. In, uh, according to the contemporary Aristotelian, it's both located in the spatiotemporal positions here and here and whatnot. Um, but it's also, you know, multiply instantiable or multiply exemplifiable. So that's really what we mean by universals. They're things like properties that are multiply instantiable. Uh, and blackness is an example. You might think of uh, humanness or humanity or felinity or maybe, um, you know, it depends on, you know, what you want in your ontology. But uh, is that is that good by way of characterization for, for the audience? I think that's good. And what's nice about that view is that the contemporary Aristotelian has a very clear answer to what particulars have in common. Mm -hmm. They have this one thing, which is the same in every instance. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not there. There aren't different examples of of the same thing. It's one and the same thing 
multiply located. And so that explains why you have this commonality because you literally have some one thing in common, yeah. which is nice. Yeah, explaining uh, objective resemblance there. So, um, so we went down this uh, horn. Is that is that um, does that characterize or does that uh, <laughs> exhaust what you want to say about these two? And can we go down the other uh, horn? Sure, okay. sure. So, if you were to say uh, yes, there are non-spatiotemporal entities. Then the question is, uh, are these non-spatiotemporal entities mind independent or not? And if they're not, that they're mind dependent, then you have a view called constructivism. And the idea there is that, yes, there are these abstract objects, these non spatiotemporal temporal things, but they are constructed. The, the usual view is conceptualism in metaphysics. And the idea is that we create or I create or God creates. There's some uh, mental being, some conceptualizer that creates these concepts. It's, that's why it's constructivism, which is the usual term in, in philosophy of mathematics. And so the idea is that if these abstract objects are mind dependent, then the view is called constructivism. And then you could have different views as to what, uh, what sort of constructivist you are depending upon whose mental activity creates them. And then you go down further. And if it's, if it's mine, then I'm gonna call it existentialism. If it's ours, it's cultural relativism or neo-Kantianism. Uh, and if it's God's, it's theological voluntarism. I don't uh, get into the weeds here on these three different views in mm -hmm. uh, the book. It's mostly just the uh, cultural version that yeah. I discuss in the book. Uh, but it's the same idea in constructivism, regardless of who say so makes it so. That's yeah, the idea. it's, you know, mind dependence. And uh, in some sense, it's dependent on mental activity and, and concepts and whatnot. And they're constructed by some particular mind or minds. That's the Correct. basic idea. Correct. All right. So that's the answer, no, to this question. Um, but what if we answer yes? Well, if you answer yes, then you're a realist. So if you think there exist mind independent, non spatiotemporal objects, in addition to mind independent spatiotemporal things, then I, that's what I'm gonna call a realist. And then the question is, is being univocal? And so uh, the idea there is, is, is a, uh, is existence so when I when I said initially, uh, ontology is suppose I ask you to get at a list and write down everything that exists. This question is well, is there just one list of things that exist? So they all exist in the same sense of existence, same mode of being, or are there multiple lists? And so if you answer no, that being is not univocal, then you're what I'm going to call a classical Aristotelian, because I think that's actually what. Aristotle's view was and how it differed from Plato's is on this issue. It's not about geography. It's not about where these things are, like the contemporary people. Like, you know, people yeah. think Plato thought the forms were up in Platonic heaven. Yeah. And Aristotle <laughs> thought they were in things, uh, which I, I'm, I'm saying is just a caricature. Yeah, that. that's the Raphael image of like Aristotle pointing down and Plato pointing exactly. down. Exactly. Yeah, so that's a, that's a beautiful caricature, gorgeous, worth seeing in person, worth going to Rome to see that. But, uh, but not helpful philosophically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and so Aristotle thought that being uh, was said in many ways, that there is no genus of being, and that uh, substances and qualities and quantities uh, and relations and so forth exist in a different, lesser sense. So universals exist, yes, but they exist in a lesser degree of reality. They're real, they're discovered, they're not created by the mind, uh, and they are discovered. And he also thought that they were eternal, like Plato. And so he doesn't have the view that the contemporary Aristotelian uh, asserts of Aristotle, uh, that, that the universals uh, can, uh, the universals for Aristotle do not come to be and pass away depending upon whether they're instantiated. As he shows in the posterior analytics, uh, that would make a mockery or make, a shred, that would shred science, right? Scientific mm -hmm. knowledge is not possible <laughs> If, if universals can come to be and pass away, depending upon whether or not they're instantiated. So the key difference for, between Aristotle himself and Plato is not about that issue. Uh, it's not about whether they're, they exist when instantiated or not. It's about whether being is univocal or not. So Plato thought that being was univocal, either something exists or it doesn't. And so he thought that the non-spatiotemporal things exist in the same sense that you and I exist in, no difference. And uh, so he's just got one list of things that exist. 
And uh, Aristotle thought that there were, well, 10 probably lists. Yeah, the categories. <laughs> so, yeah. But the key thing for Aristotle is not the 10. The key thing for Aristotle is that there's at least two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's more than one. Yeah, so for the audience, um, when we're talking about univocity and equivocity and whatnot, we're talking about the word and whether the word being or existence or exists uh, and how it is said, if it's said in many ways or if it's said in one way. So an example of like completely equivocal usage of language would be like, I hit a ball with a bat and I saw a vampire bat the other day because we went to the zoo, right? So the use of the same word bat in that case, it's not the same sense and it's not even like a related sense. They're just like completely unrelated. And, and that would be a kind of equivocal usage. By contrast, a univocal usage would be something like, um, I'm a human and Scott's a human. It's, it's, we're, it's human in the boat. We're using human, that word, in the same sense in both cases. So human is said in the exact same way, in the exact same sense, with the exact same meaning in both cases. And so what we're saying here is that under Platonism, they're taking being or existence to be used in a kind of univocal way. Everything exists in the same sense. Uh, there's just one kind of existence, as it were, um, and it applies uniformly across everything. Uh, but by contrast, the kind of classical Aristotelian is... Uh, as we're characterizing it, denies that. They say that, no, being is said in many different ways. Um, there's a sense in which there are different kinds of existence, maybe. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to wrap your mind around, but um, I'm well, just trying to I, get it for the audience. To, to differentiate it, I, I would not say kinds, I would say types. Okay, so, okay. so there's natural kinds, mm -hmm. and then there's logical types. And so the idea of equivocity pulls in this notion of logical types, uh, and not natural kinds. So, you know, cats and dogs are different natural kinds, but they're both animals in the same sense of animal. Whereas substance and quality are not different kinds of beings. They're different types of beings, different categories, different mm -hmm. logical categories. And uh, I, I think, yeah, that's, that's how I keep it straight. So it's just like, you know, the Brussels theory, right? Of simple types, uh, the idea, mm -hmm. how he yeah. solves, how he tries to solve Brussels paradox. Yeah. Uh, anyway all right so uh is that good enough by way of um this uh this diagram i want to give the people a bird's eye view so if they uh, just want to see it they can take a picture if they want um but i think we could probably uh stop sharing at this point well so the, just one more thing i guess what i would say is that the way the book works is that uh i i try i go from right to left so mm -hmm. i first motivate and explain nominalism and then say why that's not sufficient then I go to contemporary Aristotelianism, motivate that, say why that's not sufficient. Uh, and then I work my way to the left and I consider constructivism and then classical Aristotelianism. And then I should, and this isn't a knockdown argument that you have to be a Platonist, but if, if these are all the options and this structure, the way they're related is correct, then if you knock down everything other than Platonism, Platonism is the only thing left. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so that then I present a more positive account for Platonists. Sweet. That is such a good transition into what we are going to be talking about next. So let me pull up my document. We defined nominalism and Aristotelianism and Platonism. And now uh, that, that covers our definitions. And so now we're going to be going through the motivations for Platonism. And we're roughly going to be following precisely that structure that, that you follow uh, in your book. The argument is that whole destructive dilemma. I mean, that's what I do. So I consider the possibility that nominalism, uh, what would it be for nominalism with uh, uh, what it has at its disposal? Can it support what's needed for science? And uh, the idea there is that though the view is not incoherent, it's a perfectly coherent view, it can't explain how science uh, comes to be as successful as it is or make any progress. And largely because it denies that particulars have anything in common, uh, it hamstrings science in being able to explain how we can predict things that we haven't seen yet are going to be a certain way. So, for example, uh, if, if all you have on this list of things that exist are all the particulars and they have nothing in common at all, they're all utterly unique, uh, then... Uh, it's hard to know how you're gonna, how this list is gonna be useful to you. 
right? There's got to be some patterns, right? That when uh, you have item 52 on the list, that it turns out to be poisonous or it turns out to be bad for you, right? And so what you want to do is you, you don't want to just label all the poisonous things on the list. You want to be able to figure out, well, why is this thing poisonous? So that when something new comes around that I don't have on my list that I don't know already, I can avoid it without having to discover that it's poison. I can say, well, something like that is very poisonous. It looks like it has something in common. So we can reason about commonalities that we experience. Uh, but I think uh, even going further back, uh, I, I don't think, so I don't think it's possible for us to reason about our experiences unless our experiences have something in common, right? We can't recognize that we're having a red experience unless this experience I'm having now has something in common with the red experience I had before. How do I recognize it? How do I understand I'm having the same experience again? Ooh, this is exciting, or this is poisonous, something like that. And so, uh, so even with, so then we go back to perception. How does perception uh, do that? If, if we are to have perceptions at all, I think, then what we are perceiving has to be uh, have to, has to have some commonalities to it. Otherwise, we're just going to have a new experience at every moment. And it's just going to be this not understandable wash of experiences where we have no idea what's going on. Uh, and so the idea is that in order for us to experience something, we have to be sensitive to the kind of thing we're experiencing. And so we have this perceptual mechanism that, we're, that got selected for and it can't be sensitive to each and every thing that there is, because then we would have to have a, a sensor for each and every thing. We don't have to have that. Luckily, we can have something that is, that is uh, sensitive to light of a certain wavelength range. And so that anything that's within that range will cause that neuron to fire, that receptor to fire. And so because the world does have these commonalities in it. That's why over millions of years, this perceptual system got selected for, because it was useful, given that the world does present the same kinds of things over and over and over again. And so because there are these kinds of experiences that we have, and we can start reasoning about them and learning why this kind of thing will lead to that kind of result, we can start understanding patterns, causal connections, and so we need, the only way to do that is if these things have something in common. Now there's different ways that nominalists try to avoid that. I don't know how much in the de details we wanna get. Uh, I only consider class nominalism and resemblance nominalism. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, no, we can go, I, I would definitely like to go through those. So to orient the audience right now, we are, you know, we're working through that disruptive dilemma from right to left, essentially. And so right now we're looking at nominalism and we're in the process right now of basically eliminating it. That, that, that's the process yeah. that we're doing. We're focusing on right now, um, chapter two of, of Scott's book, really. And we're arguing, or at least Scott is arguing that nominalism can't adequately account for the objects or uh, success or progress or practice, other aspects of science. And so he, we're looking at, for instance, um, uh, resemblance and like objective kinds and patterns that we find in things, like you gave the example of the, the poisons. But we're also looking at here, um, explaining how human perception works and how it can, can do what it can in explaining uh, in science and, and why we need to be able to have certain common, genuinely common commonalities between different uh, perceptual experiences of ourselves at different times, as well as uh, among different scientists within a community. So um, that's what I'm just trying to orient the audience right now, uh, what you. we're doing. And so now let's look at some different ways that nominalists try to push back on this. So let's just go through the, the class and the, the resemblance nominalists. Sure. So uh, the class nominalist thinks that 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 all there is to these commonalities is a class, and so uh, David Lewis is the uh, best example of that. And the idea is that uh, all red things belong to the class of red things. And the way Lewis explains this is that you don't think uh, what you think of is that that the class is just the red things. Right, so it's not that they belong to this class; that all there is to the class are just these red things, right? So it's a reducing 
claim. You're, we're going to reduce this understanding of a class to the things that are read. Or, I mean, we can go the possibility route as well, but let's just keep it easy. <laughs> yeah, like a function across the world. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's just keep it as easy as possible. <laughs> and so the question here is, how exactly do scientists discover these classes if these things have literally nothing in common? Like, how do they decide which things go into which classes if they have nothing in common? Now, you could say it's just brute, right? They just do, right? But unfortunately, uh, you know, Lewis thinks that uh, all the different, all the many different atoms, as it were, the 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 point of of the each space time universe, uh, they do have different features, right? Like mass or spin or charge, something like that. And so there has to be some kind of commonality as to what mass is. If they all have some mass, say, in our world, then the nature of mass is something they have in common, right? Or the shape, if they're all pointy, if they're all jagged, then being jagged is something they have in common, right? And so I take it that there's, an, I mean, Lewis just doesn't think we need to explain why things are, in, are, are grouped in these classes. They just are, right? And there's no requirement. That's his response to Armstrong. There's no necessity for explaining why. Uh, they just are. And that's frustrating because we can explain why, <laughs> right? It's not like we don't have an explanation because the red things all seem to have something in common. They all reflect the longest wavelength of visible light. And so we have this explanation at our disposal. Why are we prohibited from appealing to it, right? Since it does explain why these things are grouped together. Now, the resemblance nominalists uh, are gonna say, well, the reason why we group them in the way they do is because they resemble each other, right? There's a resemblance, there's nothing in common, but there's a resemblance between them. And so what I argue there is that the resemblance doesn't work because uh, in order for things to resemble each other, they have to have some things in common and other things not in common, right? So if you and I resemble each other, it's because uh, uh, we have something in common, some things in common, right? We each have you know, two eyes, two ears, one nose, one mouth, and we have other things that are not in common. So, right, I'm 5'8", how tall are you? I'm like 5'11". 5'11", okay. So we don't have our, our height in common. Uh, but we do have the fact that we have a height in common, but our specific height, we do not have in common, right? So we have two eyes, but maybe they're different colors. That's fine, but we have some, right? So we resemble each other because the resemblance is, is there because we have a small, a subset of things that are true of us in common. That's what resemblance is. Uh, and so what I argue is that that too requires that these things, these particulars have something in common. Yeah. So that's the brief. It's, it's also like, it seems to me that a similar point with respect to the, um, or the similar point that you made against the class nominalist is also applicable to the resemblance nominalist. It's like, listen, we have an explanation for this very resemblance that we're talking about. <laughs> Namely, they have something in common reflecting the longest wavelength of visible light, you know? We have an explanation readily available, but yet they're trying to appeal to some kind of primitive or brute resemblance. Um, it's like, why stop the explanatory buck so early when we have an explanation on offer? And it's an illuminating explanation. It's precisely because, like, we can just see that, yeah, if they literally share one and the same thing, as it were, they have one and the same thing in common, well, then obviously they're going to resemble one another. We don't have to take this brute. We have an illuminating explanation. That is also useful in other parts of science. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having to do with electromagnetism and the nature of light. And, and it's just, why hamstring ourselves? Scientists yeah. don't. So to say that they have something in common seems that that's part of what makes science so powerful. Mm -hmm. And so that's yeah. why it's not sufficient for explaining how science is successful. Yeah, okay. So we went through... Um... Your basic thrust, the basic thrust of your argument against uh, nominalism from the objects of science, basically um, object like science is sensitive to um, and scientists are sensitive to kinds of perceptual features. That's precisely right. how we do repeatable experiments and whatnot. Um, so we're explaining the perceptual aspects. We're also explaining um, 
uh, objects of science themselves. So like natural kinds and things like that. And, you know, where you have these lists of uh, the poisons and it's like, it's precisely because there are things shared in common that that can kind of undergird certain inductive generalizations about the future and also um, help us avoid certain things that we might come across potentially in the future, like a new poisonous berry. Uh, so yeah. it's we're, we're explaining objective resemblances uh, among perceptual experiences as well as other objects of science. And we're arguing that um, the nominalist responses like class nominalism and resemblance nominalism and so on uh, can't really uh, adequately account for them, or at least um, they stop the explanatory buck too early when we have an illuminating explanation available. So yeah. that's uh, that's chapter two. So we can just put the, the nominalist uh, side of, or we could put the nominalist to the side and we can move on to uh, chapter three, where you're looking at the kind of contemporary Aristotelian realist and how they uh, account for the objects of science. So can you take us through what you say in that chapter? Sure. So uh, the contemporary Aristotelian, uh, what I think is key for that view is that they think of the universals as being spatiotemporal. Uh, and they're, they're one, the universals are one and the same. They're, they are what are in common to the many particulars, the universals. Uh, but they are multiply located, right? So that's one and the same thing can be located more than one place. And as David Lewis says, that seems odd. But of course, the reason that seems odd is because our intuitions are, are constructed by our perceptions and our perceptions don't recognize that sort of thing. And that's fine. Uh, Cody Gilmore tries to actually defend the view uh, in a couple papers about multiply located universals in a way that isn't uh, just assertion. <laughs> he tries to give an account of it, and I engage with that. That possibility has to do with time travel and things like that. But the main the main idea for the the um, contemporary Italian is this idea that universals uh, they have fewer universals than the Platonists because they only exist if they're instantiated. And so this is called the principle of instantiation. And there's two different ways of reading this. Uh, there's a weak version where universal exists only if it is instantiated at a time. And then there's the stronger uh, version, which is that a universal exists only if it is instantiated at some time. So it doesn't have to be exist. There doesn't have to be an instantiation at that time for the universal to exist uh, at, as long as it, there's some instantiation of it. And so the idea is that uh, the contrast with Platonists is supposed to be that the Platonists will countenance uninstantiated universals and the Aristotelian will not. That's supposed to be the, the prime difference there. And so uh, with respect to the weak version of the principle of instantiation, uh, I just point out, you know, take all the white objects in the, the universe, let Mick Jagger have his way, paint them all black, uh, there are no more white objects. Uh, and the idea is supposed to be that the universal doesn't exist, that universal whiteness uh, no longer exists. But unfortunately, and this is why uh, Aristotle doesn't plump for this view, is that at that time when there are no instantiations, scientists can still know what whiteness is, even though there are no instantiations of it. But that would be impossible if whiteness didn't exist uh, at all. And so, uh, so that's, you know, you don't want these objects of science popping in and out of existence, uh, depending upon whether they're instantiated. And so the stronger version, uh, which people like uh, Jonathan Lowe and David Armstrong put forward, is this idea that as long as universals exist, exist at some point in a space-time continuum, then the universal uh, exists at every point, right? So it's sort of like uh, the way I get, my, the way I think about this is, you know, I'm in St. Louis, right? But I, my body is not taking up all of St. Louis, right? So if I, I'm in St. Louis, I am somewhere in St. Louis. And I, that's true that I'm in St. Louis as long as I'm somewhere in it, mm -hmm. right? And so the universal exists somewhere in that space-time continuum as long as it's in, I'm sorry, the universal exists in that space-time continuum as long as it is instantiated somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. And so, uh, so what I try to argue in this chapter is that that too would not be sufficient for how science works. Why? Because uh, it's just sort of taken the possibility at sort of a 90 degree angle here, but uh, 
The idea is that if we look at the history of science, uh, it, it doesn't seem, this view would, does not seem to be able to distinguish between uh, something that uh, is not instantiated but could be instantiated as opposed to something that could not be instantiated, right? So, uh, you know, maybe evolution stops at the reptiles and there's no human being ever instantiated in this space-time continuum. Still, uh, there could be human beings, right? That's a possible kind of organism. It's just by historical accident, weren't any. And so for the, if, for the contemporary Sotilian, there wouldn't be such a thing as human beings. Right? And so that seems rather unfortunate uh, because we can figure out perhaps what kind of organisms could be. And maybe if we were to have enough knowledge, we could even make them, right? You think of a mad scientist who mm -hmm. could create, you know, the earthly version of kryptonite, right? And, or, or a scientist could figure out, we, we really don't want to make this kind, this thing is possible, but we let's make sure it never happens. As opposed to a perpetual motion machine, which could never happen, All right? Now both, neither one of them perhaps ever get instantiated, but one of them does have a uh, universal. Scientists could discover what the kind of thing that uh, uh, kryptonite would be, or earthly night or something, I don't know. <laughs> uh, some really bad thing. Uh, uh, and uh, that, that is possible, though we have discovered that perpetual motion, motion machines are not possible. Uh, the, the other thing that's interesting is that if you look at the periodic table of elements, uh, you know, when Mendeleev uh, was doing his periodic table, he noticed that there was this law of periodicity, right? And he would so have gaps, the, he would have gaps for ones that weren't discovered yet. And right. he could like predict some of their, like a lot of their properties and he got them right. <laughs> exactly. And so you say, well, there, there couldn't be, there couldn't be a, a, something that's like a noble gas that will that's you know has the causal profile of phosphorus right you could know that given that it's of this sort of thing that it's not going to have that kind of causal profile and so you can make predictions and he did he wasn't always right mm -hmm. but he made predictions and they then go out and try to discover them uh but of course and they did for for almost all of them uh but then you'd say well armstrong would say yeah but they they were instantiated right like okay but yes true but what about the, the elements, uh, the, up, the very upper end of the periodic table uh, that have only been produced through artificial means, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they discovered that there could be this kind of element and then they went about and created it and there aren't any naturally occurring, but they could have not done it. Yeah, if humans went not, extinct. Like, right, they, they could have not produced that, that uh, element, even for like the, the few nanoseconds that it did exist in the lab. Uh, they could have not done it. And so then there wouldn't be any examples of it. And yet that universal, they still discover that that's a possible element, mm -hmm. right? That's the idea. And so those sorts of discoveries are precluded from scientists uh, coming up with. And I just think that would, ham again, hamstring science in a way that isn't, uh, accurate of science and how it works. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because I kind of see these two different um, problems for the, the weaker claim and the stronger claim. Uh, they're almost like two sides of the same coin. It's like one of them, yeah. uh, all you have to do is you have to say like, well, okay, so let's focus on the one where <clears throat> the, the, they hold that the universal only exists if its instances do. And so there might be times at which the universal uh, doesn't exist, simplicit or say. Um, yeah. Like the problem with that is that, well, at those other times where the universal doesn't exist impliciter, science can still investigate the universal, find out knowledge, you know, find out truths and whatnot and, and discover truths about it. And so it doesn't, it's not able to account for that. But right. it's like, you know, the response to that is like, oh, well, if it's instantiated at some point or other, well, then it's, it exists impliciter. Bada bing, bada boom, problem solved. But it's like, no, the exact same problem comes up. Why? Because let's just switch from looking at a time at which the universal doesn't exist to a possibility in which the universal doesn't exist. Uh, right. And even in such a possibility, right, we can still gain 
serious scientific knowledge about those objects of science and whatnot, uh, even when the universal doesn't exist. And it's a non-actual possibility, you say, but um, you know, scientists are still genuinely discovering things about it. And so if you don't have these kinds of universals, like you said, you're hamstringing science. You are, you're kind of constraining in a way that is unnatural and that doesn't, doesn't really capture the facts of science itself. So right. I, I just wanted to point out that I see those as kind of like two sides of the same coin. It's like you, you could try to avoid the first problem by saying it exists at all times, but you're still stuck with just the fact that you can move the, the claim from time to possibility, so. Yeah, I mean, the, these problems are not unrelated. I mean, you know, Aristotle himself looked at identity across time, and nowadays people typically look at identity across mm -hmm. possible worlds. So it's just like a 90 degree switch. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Okay, so. That's the contemporary Aristotelian realist. And um, you know, you argue in this chapter, chapter three, that they can't really adequately account for the objects of science. Right, so, so, the, so the, what we learned from chapter two is that, that we, in order to, to uh, give a good account of science, there have to be things in common to particulars that are not the particulars themselves. And then chapter three, well, whatever those, you know, whatever those commonalities are, they can't be located in space-time. Mm -hmm. And so, that's why we get the blocking off that first arm of the dilemma. And now we're on the second yeah, now larger we're arm. Moving on to the answer of, of yes, right? Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> so right. Um, now we're looking at, um, so these guys say that, okay, yeah, sure. There are these um, non-spatio-temporal entities. Fine, you know, we're going to get rid of the nominalism and the contemporary Aristotelian realist, but why not just be a constructivist, right? Say they're mind dependent, you know? Um, so that, this is chapter four. Why can't, in your view, the constructivist adequately account for the objects of science? Well, <laughs> this is on the face of it an easy one because uh, you know the constructivist typically doesn't believe in objectivity, and so you know science is a <laughs> so that's like a big picture. But yeah, uh, but you, you don't have to get rid of that. I mean, so here's the idea uh, that uh, that if Okay, this is somewhat complicated. I'm not sure how many steps to go here. But what I try to do is, is show that to believe that these universals are mind dependent is not the idea that they, uh, that they are, uh, that we support their existence. Like that's one way of thinking of them as being dependent on us, right? If we didn't exist, then they wouldn't exist. The idea is stronger than that. It's that ultimately, right, what these abstract objects are, are up to us, right? That's the idea. Why? Why do they think that? Well, if you think that these abstract objects are uh, dependent on us, then you think that we create them. We don't discover them. Right, because they weren't there before we create. It's not like they were there and then we discovered them before we ever thought about them. That would be a denial of the very view that we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So if they have to be things that we create and don't discover, then the idea is that our creation of them can't be constrained by anything outside of our control. Right, because then we would be discovering what these things are yeah. right? and not creating them. And so if the idea is that ultimately what they are is up to us, right? Then what I argue is that that view commits them to the idea that before anyone ever creates one of these concepts, it was already true that if we agree, or if I think that such and such is the case, then that is true that it is the case, right? It can't just be, I think it, and that means I thought it. Mm -hmm. It's my thinking it has to create something, has to make something. So they're committed to this idea that in fact, what's objectively true is that I create these things just by thinking them. But that can't be the case because it already had to be the case that I can do that. Yeah. Right, so the idea is that what I try to argue is that this constructivist view has a bootstrap problem. So the idea is that it, uh, the bootstrap problem is that if you explicitly deny the very thing you implicitly have to accept. And so it, the idea is in order to get constructivism off the ground, it has to be the case that 
we are not ultimately the truth makers of these concepts. Mm -hmm. That's what I try to do. Basically, yeah, saying that it's almost like we would already, some of these things would already have to be the case, would already have to be instantiated before we were able to even come up with them, before we were even able to create them. And, and so like, you know, we have to have certain mental capacities. We have to have certain, it seems as though we would all have to, you know, be mental things. That's a single kind of thing. And it's like, so the kind being a mental thing cannot itself be a construction by our minds because it's prior to all of our mental constructions. And Correct. so it's the bootstrapping problem. You would already have to sort of um, have that kind in reality in order for there to be any of these things that can create such things at all. Um, and I, right. I so, also think so one that, way of thinking about this is, uh, you know, when people ask uh, the alleged uh, philosophical question, which came first, the chicken or the egg, clearly uh, the anti-constructivist is going to say, well, chickenness and eggness. Before there was ever a chicken, before there was ever an egg, there had to be such a thing as chickenness. In order for space-time to become that way, there had to be the kind of thing that that way is mm -hmm. in order for space-time to become that way. Mm -hmm. And so for the realist, as opposed to the constructivist, uh, these abstract objects have to pre-exist any instantiations of them. Yeah. And it seems like is, is there another mode of criticism of this view where it just can't really account for the objectivity of science? I mean, it's like the periodic tables just seems to be out and out objective, has nothing to do with, um, like you said, like if we are sort of constructing these sorts of things, if we are constructing the kinds, if we are constructing whatnot, um, and their being the way that they are is just a matter of our constructing them that way. It's like that it doesn't make any sense of the fact that the, there's a kind of objectivity to the periodic table. There's a kind of predictive and explanatory structure there that you can, you know, predict the the properties of uh, an element that is, you know, right below it, and so and so on. It's like that is not us merely constructing or making that be the case via some kind of mental activity of ours. Rather, that's out there, and we're coming to latch on to that. Um, and otherwise, we wouldn't be able to explain the objectivity of it. We wouldn't be able to explain why it facilitates such. Um, uh, technological success, predictive success, inductive generalizations and whatnot. So is there this kind of objectivity problem for this view as well? Well, absolutely, uh, <laughs> of course. And, and that's something that constructivists will embrace and they'll say, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Science isn't objective. <laughs> it's all about power. Reductio, okay. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's all about power. Thank you very much for proving my point. Yes. Uh, but of course, uh, well, we could get that. That's a long, uh, that's a that, <laughs> That's a rabbit hole we could get into. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so I, I think that's good for um, constructivism. So we got down that horn of the dilemma. They're not mind dependent. Uh, so you argue in this this chapter that we're just closing out. So they are uh, now mind independent. And now we are trying to decipher between the classical Aristotelian realist and the Platonist. So Correct. on to chapter five for the Arist classical Aristotelian realist, what uh, why can't they adequately account for the objects of science and or what is wrong with their view? Yeah, so there's a lot to recommend. There's a lot lot to uh, like about the classical Aristotelian view. It, uh, it, the view is that, yes, there are mind independent, uh, uh, non-spatiotemporal universals that particulars have in common that Aristotle calls universals, absolutely. But don't think of them as existing in the same sense that you and I exist and think of them as a lesser sense, a uh, derivative sense. Uh, and, you know, so it's not, it's not really a free lunch, uh, like, you know, Armstrong talks about universals, you know, you get particulars, you get universal for free. It's more like a reduced lunch. You get, you get, you know, it's cheaper. It's a, it's a bargain. You know, you get, you get the same, here's the idea. You get the same explanatory benefits as the Platonist, but for a lower ontological cost. I mean, that's great. Why wouldn't you go for that, right? Uh, and uh, it, it also helps explain uh, the unity of substances. It helps explain the mind-body problem. It helps explain uh, how intentional objects are not extensional objects in a way. They exist in a lesser sense. Uh, 
Uh, it helps you block regresses like the third man argument and Bradley's regress. I mean, there's just so many benefits. Uh, the neo-Kantian gets to say that, uh, that, that morality, it has to do with uh, regulative principles as opposed to substantial theories of the good, right? And it's all, you can always tell a, a class course in when they talk about mirror. It's a, it's a mirror regulative principle, right? Or it's, it's, it's merely an intentional object. It's not like an extensional object. I mean, that would really be something. It's just this, you know, an intentional object. More respectable. <laughs> More respectable. It's a lower commitment, you know? Yeah. And so the idea is that you get the same benefits for a lower ontological cost, and you get you get all sorts of other benefits that the Platonist doesn't get. Uh, and so there's, it seems like it's win-win. The problem, though, is unfortunately that committing yourself to a uh, a theory of being where being is not univocal gives you a theory which is self-referentially incoherent. Uh, why? Well, just as you know, we saw, you know, Russell's theory of logical types was shown to be self-referentially incoherent uh, uh, pretty soon after he proposed it. Uh, the idea is that if you state that, so the idea is that there's no being, uh, there's no genus of being. So all the different senses of being have no, no thing in common, no genus of being under which all the different senses of being are. Aristotle's idea, as you were putting it before, is that they're related because they all point to cross hen. They all point toward uh, all the other categories, point toward substance. It's fundamental, right? It's the fundamental sense. And they are lesser, but there's no genus of being. So there's no way to compare them, yeah. right? They have nothing, there's no common coin in virtue of which you can say, compare them. And so the basic idea is that if Aristotle thinks that being is said in many different ways, then uh, if that's true, uh, then it's meaningless. Uh, why? Because you can't compare them to say that this, the different senses of being are different. So here's the idea. So Aristotle thinks, this is in uh, Metaphysics Book 4, uh, Chapter 2, he says that uh, uh, being is said uh, 10 different ways. So there's being a substance, being a quality, being a quantity, being a relation, and there's no, nothing in common there. And so being one, so the, the idea of one is there's a different sense of one for every category. So there's being one substance, being one quality, being one quantity, being one relation, being one place. Uh, and so uh, there's no genus of oneness. Uh, then therefore being one and the same as is a different sense of same for every category and likewise for different. So there's being one in the same substance as, one in the same quality as, one in the same quantity as, and so forth for all 10 categories. And so to say that there are 10 different categories, there is no sense of different in which you could say that that's true, Amen. that you can use to compare different categories. And yeah, so it's a cross-categorial judgment, which is debarred by his very own view because the sense of being and oneness and hence one in the sameness, that's kind of wholly internal to each of the, um, the respective categories. Yeah, the, the different Correct. senses. And so it's not as though you can go beyond and outside of them and compare or say, no, this is not one in the same sense of being as this one, or this is not one in the same sense of oneness as this one. It's like, no, you, if you do that, you've just accepted that there's this cross categorical single univocal sense of oneness or identity or being or difference and, and so on. And that's how Aristotle can get out of this mess. If he would admit that there's an 11 sense of being one, same and different, that you can use across all 10 categories, then all those sentences can come back and be evaluated as being true or false. They can all be meaningful. But unfortunately for Aristotle, that's Plato's view. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so Aristotle, Aristotle can, uh, can, uh, can remain in, can, can commit himself to a, to a, self-referentially incoherent view, or he can become a Platonist. Choice is his. <laughs> yeah. So I wonder, I wonder if he would, if Aristotle, you know, I got to put on my Aristotle cap and, you know, try to respond. Um, I wonder if he would say, well, okay, being is not said in the same way across these different categories, but maybe like oneness 
is said in the same and okay so maybe aristotle himself didn't hold this but let's suppose that this is schmeristotle you're talking to and so schmeristotle is going to say okay fine being is said in different senses but you know we can still say one and and mean the same thing across categories and one in the same as and so we could do these kind of cross categorial comparisons without allegedly uh committing to the univocity of being so what do you think of that response well, what do I think of that response? Uh, hmm, let me think about this. So uh, I don't know how one would differentiate, how one would sort of, um, you know, fence off one from being. Yeah. Yeah, they're like intimately tied. Like if yeah. you have something that exists, then you have one thing. And if you have one thing, then you have something that exists. Like it seems as though they're at least necessarily coextensional. <laughs> um, and yeah. this is what Peter Van Inwagen, for instance, you know, points out in some of his stuff on um, being an ontological commitment. He's like, being is intimately related to number. It's like to say that something exists is to say that the number of that, you know, the, the number of those things is one, you know, it's right. just, so it's like, they're, they're really intimately related. So it's really hard to see how you could divorce these, but I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to do my best for Schmeristotl here. So <laughs> do you have anything else to, to say in response to that? Uh well, I mean, I think that uh, I, I like, I like, of course, I would like to be able to be, have a more ontologically economical view, uh -huh. but I think that the idea is that you get what you pay for. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we can cut any corners, unfortunately. Uh -huh. So uh, I also think that it's not very scientifically respectable. I to have a scientist having to commit themselves to the idea that being is equivocal or being is is said in many ways i, I don't i just can't see how they would even approach that as being naturalistic in any way whatsoever yeah it's also i mean there are also other you know you you kind of run this self-referential um incoherence argument but there are also you know other ways to probably push back on it lots of other ways you know like one of them is it's, it's really even hard to understand what, what he's trying to get at when he says that um, it exists in a different sense or it's like some kind of lesser exists. Like, what are you talking about? Like, I, I, don't, I feel like Peter Van Inweg, like, I don't understand what you're saying. Like, it's like, it's either existent or it's not. It's either in reality or it's not. There is either an X with which it's identical or there isn't. It's like, that's all there is to it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the way that I can get my mind around it is by thinking about how Frege did it. Uh, and the, I, the way that he explained it is that you, you have complete and incomplete things. So, you know, a function expression like X squared, right? Oh, uh, yeah. on its own, yeah. that's not, it's, yeah, it's not a well-formed. Well, it's on its own. It's not a thing in itself. It's not an object. It's the concept. Yeah. Right. So he divides objects and concepts and, you know, you can't, uh, group them together as if they were on the same level of reality. And so like a number is a thing, but a concept, it's not nothing, but it's not something either. It's a, it's an incomplete thing. And then when you put, right, when you put the number two in the, the parentheses squared, that takes you to another number. So, right, so like a, a way, a way of getting to another number is not itself a number. It's merely the way of getting from one thing to another. So it's not nothing, but it's not something either. And so the, the way that Frege explains it is this idea of being incomplete. It's got this, it's got this hole in it where you put something, a thing into, right? And so that's how he explains predicates, right? Concepts, mm -hmm. right? So like blank is running. You can, that's the concept of running and you put the cat in the thing and it takes you to the true or it takes you to the false. Mm -hmm. Right, with true, true, and the true and the false are things, and uh, the cat is a thing, but the 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 concept is not like a thing, but it's not nothing either. Right. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, I guess it helps a little bit. It does help yeah. a little bit. It kind of makes it slightly less unintelligible. <laughs> okay. So um, I I tend to think that yeah, being is is too difficult. It's difficult for me to. Well, I'm, I'm with you, but <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's hard to, hard to wrap my mind around. Uh, I think, at, I think at first it's really hard, but then you do it for a while and it starts to make a lot of sense. 
<laughs> it, sounds it's, really it's, familiar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, okay, so that's um, that's the classical Aristotelian realist. Um, you said, like you pointed out, you know, it seems to have a, a lot of advantages to it, except, um, you know, it does seem self-referentially incoherent, which is a pretty big problem, um, yeah. given that you need to make these cross-categorial comparisons to say that there are 10 different categories. And that requires some one sense of difference and hence identity and hence oneness being existence that it requires some kind of one sense that's cross-categorial. And so it's kind of self-undermining. So that's the view. Um, that's the Aristotelian realist view. And uh, we, we've set that one aside. And you know, that would be, if these arguments succeed, that would be the successful constructive or destructive dilemma, right? We, we said, are there non-spatiotemporal things? We got rid of the, the peeps who say, um, no, there are no non-spatiotemporal things. So then we focused on whether or not the spatiotemporal things that do, the non-spatiotemporal things that do exist, we focused on whether or not they're mind dependent. We got rid of the peeps that said, uh, yeah, they are mind dependent. And then we looked at um, the Aristotelian realist and it seems as though we're going to have to get rid of them as well, which leaves Platonism. And that gets us to chapter six. So that's your positive account in terms of Platonism. So can you take us through this positive account? Sure. So uh, the two ideas in the chapter, well, there are many ideas in the chapter, but the two main ideas are uh, that, that the, the objects of scientific experiments are, uh, are systems. They're not substances. And the idea is that uh, uh, instead of thinking of the world as being just a whole bunch of self-subsistent things, like a collection of things, it's better to think of the world as being uh, all, uh, uh, hmm, <laughs> I don't know the world. I mean, it, it, th think of it, everything as being a four-dimensional system, right? And so that there are no simples in space time, everything is complex. And the idea of complexity is that you have uh, different things that are related to each other in a non-additive way. So they're functionally interdependent uh, with each other. So when you think about a basketball team, right? A basketball team isn't just the players. A basketball team is the players being functionally interdependent in a certain way. And the reason why they're a team or not is because they do those functions well or badly. If each player just plays on their own, they're not a team. And right. And so in order to be a team, they have to be sensitive to what the others are doing and change what they're doing uh, and have some feedback mechanisms in what they're doing. Just like uh, in a, if you're in a band, you have to listen to what the other musicians are doing in order to make music as opposed to just a bunch of noise. Okay, and so the idea is that for the Platonist uh, that nothing in space-time is essentially what it is. Everything in space-time is accidentally what it is, is contingently what it is. And so when you point at this, this thing here before you is contingently human, but it's also contingently white and it's also contingently five foot eight, and it's also half of a married thing, and it's also seven billion, billion, billillion atoms, and it's all those things are in this region of space time at the same, in the same region of space time. And that uh, Aristotle could not abide by that. People who believe in substances cannot abide by that because he doesn't think that a substance can be made up of other substances, because that would just be a heap of things. And so the parts of a substance can't be other substances. They have to be merely parts, right? And not other substances. Whereas the, the Platonist thinks that, yeah, there's no problem having lots and lots of things, having a heap of things here. Uh, but the idea is that the heap of things here can be differentiated, the different things in this heap, if the criteria by which you identify those different systems are scale relative. Right, so if you have, uh, if you're measuring at the angstrom length scale, you're going to be identifying those seven billion 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 atoms. Right, uh, you're not going to be able to, to identify the human that's there. If you use a measuring scale at the one meter length scale, then you could measure, you could find the human. And so the idea is that it's not like these scales are, are uh, made up by us; they're discovered by scientists, and we are discovering. Uh, all different kinds of systems at very fine grain uh, measuring scales and very coarse grain measuring scales. 
And uh, all of these things are related to each other more or less, and uh, none of them are more fundamentally what exists than anything else. They all exist equally. And so scientific experiments are just about those dynamical systems and discovering what they are, those interrelations between those different subsystems that like atoms are a, are a system. And so they're a subsystem of the cells and so forth. Uh, and then the, the criteria by which we discover these things in our world, uh, that there are atoms or there are humans or there are solar systems or whatever, are these non-spatiotemporal parameters and those are the, the objects of scientific knowledge. And uh, these things are non-spatiotemporal, so they aren't located anywhere. Uh, they're, so because they're non-spatial, they're not located anywhere. Because they're non-temporal, they can't change. Uh, they can't be created. They can't be destroyed. Uh, they're eternally whatever they are. And they exist whether they're instantiated or not. Right? They're independent of space-time. There, there's no causal relation between them and the world. They're, just uh, explanatory for what the, uh, the identity of these, so it's not causal explanatory, it's not, yeah. it's not a causal explanation, right? The, um, the law of gravity does not cause the apple to fall from the tree. It explains why it falls in the way that it does, right? In terms of uh, its acceleration toward the earth. Uh, so there's no causal interaction. But the Platonist is, uh, thinks that in order to identify the causal antecedents in the spatiotemporal world that do cause the later effects, those, that kind of thing has to have some identity. And that's what these non-spatiotemporal things are. They explain what this is, right? The, 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 the kind of thing that smoking is, is discovered to have a connection with the kind of thing cancer is, right? We, we connect these, but you can't identify that cause in the world as the smoking, unless what it is to be smoking has some nature okay. that is what it is. And that's what scientists discover. Uh, and this is true, I think, for all scientists. So the Platonist doesn't accept the fact value distinction, would think that all everything's a matter of fact, nothing is a matter of value. So um, my friends in the social sciences do not like it when I say this, but I think that what they're doing is discovering uh, these kinds of social structures that are in fact good for people and in fact bad for people. And it doesn't have to do with our, you know, arbitrary desires. Uh, and same with hum uh, knowledge in the humanities. Uh, I think it's the same in an ethics. I, I don't think uh, I think that these are all scientific questions because there's an objective truth to, to know. But I guess I should say very clearly that just because I think that there are these objective criteria for identifying everything that we, that we care about and things that we don't care about because we don't know about them is that we don't know what they are. Mm -hmm. So science is, that's why, you know, as Einstein said, that's why it's called research because we don't know, right? And so if you're a realist, uh, I, I, you, I understand that historically speaking, the vast majority of realists thought they knew what the objective truths were and inflicted those on people. And that's why most often people don't wanna go in for realism when they're constructivists because of that legitimate historical problem, human arrogance. But that's because of human arrogance, it's not because of realism, right? So the idea of realism, there's no guarantee you're gonna know what those truths are. Uh, the idea is that you discover them and that going along with believing that there are these objective truths, I think it's pretty important to uh, remember some intellectual humility. And so if there are these objective truths and you have a guess, hopefully educated guess as to what they are, then you don't inflict these on other people. You don't force people. You engage in dialogue with people about them uh, to see what they think those objective truths are. You don't force them mm -hmm. to follow what you think your best guess, because it's just a guess, right? So... Uh, so the positive, okay, and then I have some other things I do there about modal truths, but that's a basic idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what's also nice is that your account can kind of reach back and look at some of the problems afflicting the other ones and say, hey, we have a solution to those things. So, so for instance, like 
you also have an account of the objectivity of, of science, right? That's, that was the, one of the main problems with the constructivist, right? Um, there actually are objectively, independently of us, these objective kinds. And the scientists are investigating them, probing them, discovering truths about them. Look at the periodic table. So you have the objectivity in your account that you can explain. You, have, you can explain commonality and resemblance, right? You can explain the, the perceptual experiences, both within an individual scientist across times. So they have the exact same kind of perceptual experience. That's how you can undergird uh, their repeatable trials and whatnot, but also in a community of scientists. And also uh, commonality and resemblance among the things that you're discovering and probing about. Uh, so you have the commonality and resemblance you can explain. You can explain a lot of the um, technological, predictive, explanatory, and inductive success of science because it's precisely because a lot of these things in, re in reality fall under one kind that you can make inductive generalizations about other things that fall under that kind because that kind kind of determines some of the properties that they um, must or would have in unobserved cases. So you can explain yeah. the success, the pr predictive technological success. You can explain uh, objective resemblance and, and objectivity and all these other sorts of things. So it's like, Everyone accept it. No, <laughs> I, I'm trying. I'm trying to push your view here, but um, thank you. I yeah, <laughs> but um, so that's that's the positive. So we went through each chapter of your book. Um, the, your, we went through your positive account. And we went through the destructive dilemmas, and we went through the payoffs of your account. So let's look at some of the like objections. Sure. <laughs> so let's some of these it. some of these are better than others. Um, yeah. and you know we've just got probably about you know 15 minutes left to go through this, but you know we'll 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 cover what we can. Sure. So the first objection is um queerness or spookiness okay so platonism posits entities that are just intuitively like really weird or strange or spooky or queer and and all else being equal we should reject such voodoo metaphysics right that is absolutely metaphysics which posits spooky or queer entities like shadows and cold fronts and whatnot but so the objection goes Platonism does just that, right? There are these non-spatiotemporal kinds and universals and whatnot. And these are intuitively quite odd. Uh, and indeed, arguably, there are infinities upon infinities of such things, uh, many of which seem intuitively strange. Like, why would fundamental reality, as it were, care to include the existence of abstract, multiply instantiable numbers, say, or, you know, things like that? Um, and we also have to, excuse me, we have to also have to account for the fact that um, we don't seem, so these objectors say, we don't seem to have an account of the intrinsic character of these things apart from the explanatory roles and functions that they play. So there are those two aspects to it, the kind of queerness and strangeness, firstly, and secondly, um, I guess, uh, a lack of an independent characterization of them. So can you, can you tell us what you make of the, this kind of queerness objection? Yeah, so uh, absolutely, they seem queer because what seems normal is what we can perceive. And so the fact they're non spatiotemporal temporal like you can't see them. You know, I, I'm in Missouri, I'm in the show me state, you know, can't see it, you can't show it to me, I don't believe it, right? Uh, so it's, it's got, you know, the home of radical empiricism right on my license plate. It's, it's tough being a Platonist. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, uh, I think it was uh, a who who raised this epistemological worry that you know is there is there some kind of special faculty by which we uh, apprehend these and you know Gödel thought yeah there is some special mental faculty by which we 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 grasp these but you know I I actually don't see what why this is such a bizarre problem because it's just boring old reasoning that allows us to go beyond experience, right? With, um, with non-deductive forms of inference of induction and, uh, and abduction, uh, we can infer inductively generalizations about things that we will never see. Uh, that, you know, even after we go extinct, even after we destroy the earth, uh, this, you know, in the morning, it'll get light in the Eastern uh, horizon, mm -hmm. uh, even after we we destroy our our ability to live here, and yet when I understand how our solar system works, I can right I can reason to that thing that no one will ever see. Of course, people will say, yeah, but it's still observable, right? Even though no one's going to see it, it's still observable, so it doesn't seem weird, right? Uh, that's that is true. But, uh, and you know, the platonic non-spatial temporal things are in principle not observable, mm -hmm. 
right? They could not be observed. And so uh, the idea is that then we look to abduction, right? Just inference of the best explanation. And the kind of argument I'm making here is that, that we have to believe in these non-spatiotemporal things because without them, as I've shown in the rest of the book, we can't explain how science works. Mm -hmm. So as weird as they may seem because we can't perceive them, science can't actually succeed in doing what it does unless there's more to reality than what we can perceive. Mm -hmm. And so that's the best I can do. I can't, I mean, if to make them less queer is to make them observable, I can't do it. I just think that they're not that weird because our reasoning puts us in touch with things that we don't observe. Yeah. Yeah. And I've always thought that this objection is, is it's interesting, but it's just like, first of all, I would just want to say like, deal with it, right? We've got, we've got this destructive dilemma argument and if it works, it works, right? You just got to deal with it. <laughs> like, can you tell me what's wrong with the argument, you know, uh, address right. the argument. So like, I, I just want to say that that's one thing. The second thing is like, yeah, maybe they're equating, um, non-queer with observable and, and queer with non-observable but it's just like the more that I think about really anything like the queer it becomes to the point that I just want to say like everything is queer uh, honestly <laughs> like hashtag everything is queer um I, like what is an electron right like oh like when you're when you're in freshman chemistry right you might think of it as just a tiny little billiard ball bashing into other billiard balls but it's like no that's that's Super, that's like corpuscularian superstition. No, it's like this cloud of probability. Right. It's like, what is a cloud? What that's is pretty a, weird. What is probability? Like, what is physical probability? Like, it's it's insane. I, the more you think about it, and it, like the more mathematical it gets, and it's just like you lose track of the physical reality itself. And it's like, it's so queer. But yet, no one's going around saying, ah, oh, these electrons are queer. Like, let's get rid of them. It's like, no, everything is queer, including electrons, including all the things that you nominalists love. So right. like, deal with it, okay? So, <laughs> so that's what I wanna say. Um, so we covered the queerness objection, but you touched briefly on the Banasarac problem. And so this is a kind of like, I don't know, I see this is the biggest one that I see people raise to, to Platonism. So I do want to like explicitly cover it. Um, uh, and, and so the problem is roughly that hey, prima facie knowledge requires causal contact with the thing known, apparently. <laughs> I know we're going to challenge that, but knowledge requires causal contact with the thing known, but you can't come into causal contact by definition with these platonic abstract objects. Therefore, you can't come to knowledge about them. So uh, boom, debunked. What do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that, uh, I don't think that the, the assumption that in order to know something, you have to have causal contact with it is correct. I think in order to perceive something, you have to have causal contact with it. That's right. But I think the idea of, re I mean, it, if scientific knowledge is reasoning about our experience, which is what I think it is, it's just reasoning mathematically, uh, rigorously about the, our experiences and discovering what's true about the world, then these ex explanations about what's going on uh, are not things that you have causal contact with. It's that you've gone beyond the things you have causal contact with. So yeah, if you have a causal theory of knowledge, then Platonism is dead in the water. Yeah. And I, I mean, you know, this is a, this is a, a problem for mathematical knowledge mm -hmm. and uh, as well. And, you know, I think that what example I give in the book is I think that kids are learning about these abstract objects when they play musical chairs, right? You know, and they're, they're playing musical chairs and they, they learn that six is different than five because they're sitting on the ground. Yep. <laughs> like that's what they're learning, right? They're learning about the relations between the different numbers. Uh, and that's true, whether you're talking about chairs or anything else. And so uh, I think that kids are reasoning, they're learning about numbers. And so uh, I just, I don't see why we should uh, require uh, that all knowledge be knowledge of things you have causal contact with. I, I do think that the world does give our intellect a kick, right? So there was this disease, uh, people were getting sick and dying in the Bay Area in the early eighties. And uh, initially they thought that it was a new form of cancer 
And so scientists, because that was happening and they didn't, it didn't make sense, say, they, well, maybe it's a new kind of cancer. And they started doing investigations and then they came to discover that, no, it's not cancer. It's a new disease altogether that we've never seen before, AIDS. And so, right, the world does, unfortunately, in this way, cause us to become aware that there's more in, more going on than we're aware of, right? So the, but, and, but the nature of AIDS is eternal. And unfortunately, now we know about it. But what the, what the causal mechanism was were these perceptions, right? Things in the space-time world that caused us to kick our intellect into gear and go, whoa, whatever is this? What's, what, this is something, this is a kind of thing we've never seen before. What is this? And then they discover the kind by reasoning about those experiences that goes beyond just the experiences. So Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder, I wonder if this objection is self-defeating. It's like the question. Okay, so they have a claim, right? The claim is in order to know something, you have to have causal contact with it. But it's like, how do you know that claim? It's like, <laughs> did, did that claim like bonk you on the head and like say, oh hey, I'm true? It's like, I mean, maybe you came maybe you're like looking out in the world and you're like, ah, well, I, I, I see that I know that thing and that uh, that thing came into causal contact with me. And I see, so is it like an inductive generalization? What's like, did the, did the reliability of induction cause your, your thought that like, no, like the, the reliability, like, I, I don't, I don't see how you could even have causal contact with this very datum. It's like, they are themselves have to use reason. They have to use induction inference to the best explanation. Theoretical virtues in comparison, explanatory power, breadth, depth, simplicity, unification. They have to use these things in order to come to knowledge of this very fact. But it's like those sorts, that application of reason is exactly what the Platonist is doing when they're coming to the conclusion that Platonism is true. Uh, I just don't, I don't see any, maybe I see some force behind it, but I think it's extremely little and extremely minimal and it should not worry Platonists at all. <laughs> no, I, I don't think it should either. And I think the reason it does is, is because uh, there is an understandable, uh, understandable uh, bias, uh, prejudice in, in favor of perception. Yeah. It's a powerful experience. <laughs> Obviously, yeah. and uh, it's it's developmentally fundamental, right? I mean, when we're born, it's all we got. Yeah. And but I, I think you know we have reason when we're born, but we aren't very good at it. And then we start reasoning pretty quickly when uh, we start making connections between different kinds of events. And so I, I think I understand why it's powerful bias. I do, but I think that just like other biases, we can recognize it and eliminate it yeah yeah okay so summary for the audience of our response to the banana problem because this is the biggest one that i see people raise so our response mainly is that knowledge doesn't require a causal contact with the object of knowledge there are lots of ways to come to know something that don't require a causal contact you can have inference to the best explanation you know we have causal contact with ordinary particulars uh and we observe various phenomena about them like objective resemblance uh we see the success and progress and process of science and studying them and so on and we use standard explanatory reasoning like comparing theoretical virtues of competing explanations and so on to infer that abstract objects best explain or at least provide the only explanation for in some cases the relevant phenomena right that does not require abstract that does somehow causally impinge on us in some way but that's sure as hell a way to come to knowledge of them so that's one of our responses i guess the second response well there is a self-defeating response as well but another response that i wanted to say is like there's another kind of connection which isn't causal but it's explanatory and i think that any intuition or argument supporting the thesis that knowledge requires a kind of causal contact would equally support the claim that knowledge requires only some explanatory connection with the object of knowledge but in that case right the platonists can easily accept that there is some kind of explanatory connection between abstract objects and our belief therein right abstract to partly explain the success or the objects or the process of science and our beliefs about science are themselves explained by that very success and progress and so on and so by transitivity of explanation abstracta explain uh, at least partly our belief therein and so yeah. our, our belief in abstracta is indeed relevantly explanatorily connected in a knowledge conferring way to the fact that there are such abstract <laughs> so it's like why again any argument for this kind of causal connectivity requirement I think would equally be an argument for an explanatory connectivity requirement, which is slightly 
slightly weaker in some sense. And the Platonist can satisfy that, even if the Platonist cannot satisfy the causal requirement. Correct. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So I'm on board with that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, we are at about one hour and 27 minutes. So I guess we are going to uh, kind of wrap it up there. Do you have any final comments or final words about the discussion as a whole or um, your view? Uh, or, uh, yeah. Final comments. What, what do you think? Well, I, uh, obviously there's a lot more in the book than we, yeah. what we talked about and the arguments are laid out. Uh, I guess I just want to thank you for this. This has been quite fun and I'm glad, uh, I, I hope, I hope it's helpful and I hope it's helpful also to non-philosophers. I hope obviously it's helpful to philosophers, uh, but I, I think even non-professional philosophers, uh, could, uh, I think get something out of the book and it's just a, a, a reappraisal of the, the arguments for Platonism uh, are, I think, well, because Plato's view has not really been part of the discussion in metaphysics, I think, I just hope that this adds to that historical discussion in a way that takes it seriously and doesn't just dismiss the caricature that rightly has been dismissed. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on. That was very, very, very fun. I really enjoyed that. And I cannot wait to upload this Hey, for the audience, if you guys have enjoyed this, be sure to smash that like button and subscribe, of course. And also, if you've made it to this point, you guys probably see value in the work that I do. So please consider becoming a patron or making a one-time donation. Any help is appreciated. I am a lowly college student who has to eat like dirt and worms for dinner every night. So um, <laughs> you can help. You can help me upgrade to like bird poop or something that would be better um so consider supporting me on patreon everyone and um what better way to end is there then i'm joe schmidt this is the majesty of reason and peace out